ADHD Rewired, episode 463. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are recording the last live Q&A of 2022. So let me just quickly introduce our panel here, which I think if I, my memory serves me correctly, which is always questionable. Um, I forgot to do that last Q&A. So let's start off with that. Uh, I'm Eric Tivers. Y'all, I think, know me. Uh, to my left on here on Zoom is Will Kerb, host of Hacking Your ADHD. What's going on, Will? Hey, and for those of you that were saw me last month, yeah, I was sick then. I'm still sick. It's oh, been great. Oh, man. <laughs> the, the team's on the struggle bus today. You, Brendan. All right. Uh, to my right, we got MJ Siemens, the host of ADHD Diversified. Hi, everybody. How's, How's it, going? it going? I mean, it's going. And uh, we didn't say anything about Will's amazing, cozy-looking sweater because... It's a plushy sort of foam green sweater with plants on it and it's super adorable. And I got an awesome holiday sweater with a cat destroying a village. For those of you who can see. Laser beam cat eyes. <laughs> awesome. All right. And just below MJ, we have coach Kristen Martz. How you doing, Kristen? Doing okay. I am from Little Rock, Arkansas, but hanging out here in Chicago right now. And we'll be meeting up with Eric and Kat to do some in-person work together in a couple days. So I'm doing great because it's colder here and I'm not as hot. <laughs> awesome. And just to the left on my screen uh, is Lisa Cisla, who is my executive assistant, community manager, and all fun things like that. Hi, Lisa. How you doing? Hi, everyone. How are you? All right. And the bottom of the screen, we got Coach Kat Hoyer. How you doing, Kat? Iron frog hair split three ways. <laughs> and just to the left of Kat, we have Brendan Mahan, host of ADHD Essentials. How you doing, Brendan? Doing okay. I can see out of my eyes now, so that part's good. <laughs> Brendan's coming off of having <laughs> a little allergy attack from uh, pulling out the old Christmas tree. <sighs> We're buying a new one. I'm not. I'm not dealing with that tree ever again. I don't even want to put it to pieces back in the box. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> All right, it's time for something new. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Let's bring up uh, Lily. I'm just wondering if someone knows about an already existing group for business owners who have ADHD. I'm talking about a group that would be. A networking slash mastermind group. I suppose some accountability, but more the mastermind and networking. Since I've never really been in a mastermind and I love being around people with ADHD. All right. So have you been through our program? No, I haven't. I've considered it. I just, not yet. Because <laughs> right, masterminds are actually part of what we do in the group. And so okay. within the group, you're, all the accountability teams, it's, it's a four-member accountability team will be paired into these uh, mastermind sessions. And we have a whole kind of format and uh, agenda and structure for you to follow. Um, and you get to do several of them during the, the season of your coaching groups. And lots of, lots of members will continue masterminding things well afterwards. And then our alumni program, um, they have solopreneur groups and uh, we have, there's other okay. things kind of similar to that that are being done right now in our alumni program. So if you're looking specifically cool. for people with, you know, to do this kind of stuff with ADHD. It's been created. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, come, come to our next registration event. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Thanks, Lily. 
All right, let's go to another one. All right, we got Mary. Hi, Mary, how are you? I'm pretty good, really. I'm in my second week of retirement. I retired. I was a full-time nanny, and my back started to hurt. I said, oh, that's a good sign that I can retire. But I'm really, really afraid that I will end up, as my mother did, in a recliner binging on computer solitaire games, or for her, it was the Game Show Network. And I really feel like I need help finding, setting and following through with my intentions while I'm in this new phase of my life. Okay. So what if instead of calling it retirement, we call that your encore phase? Okay. Because to me, an encore is a performance. What do you want to do? I'm not sure. Oof, I'm not sure what my energy level is, is even anymore um, because I don't do enough physical exercise and that's something I really need to fit into my life. But I have been a life coach before. I was a life coach for parents. That was probably 15 years ago and I really enjoyed it, but had a terrible time marketing it. Everybody said, oh, can't you just tell me what to do? And I'm like, well, that's really not how coaching works. Thank but, you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's see what's working in your life, you know, but, um, and I loved that and know how great coaching is, which is one reason I'm really looking at your coaching and accountability groups. And I have also looked for support for retired women with ADHD. And I found a few little things, but it doesn't seem like that's there. I'm thinking that maybe I could be a life coach for retired women or women who have a lot of gray hair or whatever it's called. <laughs> so there, that's one thing. I also like to do all kinds of creative things. All right. So um, you, let me back you up a little bit. You said that you wanted to be more physically active. Yeah. What would that look like for you? Um, to maybe move more than 1500 steps a day you know, or something like that. I, I have a knee that bothers me and a back that bothers me and I'm, very klutzy, so I've always injured myself doing any kind of physical activity. It doesn't doesn't matter what it is. I just get injured, so I'm afraid of it. Okay. I'm trying to sign up for a gym that seems to cater to older people, and Great. that process is making me overwhelmed as well. Okay. Talk to us about that. What's overwhelming about that, that process? Well, I started the process back in June when I knew that I was going to have a week off of work in July and that they give you a free week to start. And so I went and to sign up for it and they gave me a health questionnaire. And one of the things was, do you ever feel breathless? And I had been going through some anxiety things that I didn't realize were anxiety. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sometimes I do. And they're like, well, you have to get a note from your doctor. So I, my doctor called back about that the first time in October. I, I, clearly one of my goals is to get a new PCP, but um, so I'm nervous about going in and saying, I'm here for the free week. And they'll say, well, you still haven't gotten your note from your doctor. And um, I've always been very embarrassed in gyms. I don't know. I don't feel like I fit into the culture, that kind of stuff. And I'm pretty sure that there are gyms that really cater to that person. And I think you maybe mentioned that that's where you were kind of looking. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions. One, what is your, you said you also want to find a new PCP. Um, what actions are you taking on that? I have taken action on that and yes. I'm waiting until January to, well, actually, I think I could probably do it now. I had to get new insurance because the new year. And so possibly this afternoon, I will look, look at that list that I have and try getting an appointment. So when you're thinking about the things that you're kind of overwhelmed by, whether it's kind of figuring out what you're going to be doing, whether it's it's identifying the the next steps for the signing up for the gym or the finding this doctor, is this all in your head or is this, have you written this out anywhere? I have so many lists. Okay. I lose lists. I say sometimes, oh, I feel so listless because I my lists are everywhere. Notebooks. I'm like, well, this one's going to work. Oh, now I'm going to start using... Um, Sticky notes and oh, where did those sticky notes go? I spent like 10 minutes looking for the sticky note I wrote on last night. And gosh, do I have ADHD? I don't know. <laughs> um, I have some on my phone. I do. I, it's been better since I'm not working. Okay. These past few weeks, I've been able to just like, okay, here's another list. Let's put it back on this list and try to get them consolidated. But yeah, okay. I have things written down like that. So I think that the, the more we can sort of break the action steps down and see them in front of us, I think the, the more helpful that can be. Um, when you create a list, are you putting like 
30 things on the list? No, I have 30 lists with three things on it. Okay. <laughs> okay. And is, um, are, and are I'm you getting only better at that? I mean, I, I'm getting better at breaking things down and saying, okay, decorate the Christmas tree, get out the decorations, you know, just subtitles and, right. you know, just doing right. one of those things at a time. But I'm on the part right now where you put all the boxes back that are empty. Anyway. Well, one, one of the things that I've, when I think about, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be 43 so I still have some time before I'm that retirement age. But like when I think about retirement, I don't think I ever want to retire because the idea of all this unstructured time kind of exactly. terrifies me. Um, so it. it's what are the things that you've always wanted to do? And then how can you create structure around doing those things? And structure, you know, especially when you have ADHD, if it's only you, like that's going to feel harder. So the more like groups you can get involved in and classes you can uh, get involved in, I think it might be helpful for that structure, especially starting out your day that way, because I think that will help kind of build momentum. So I don't know if that's that's helpful for you. I think Brendan had a, uh, a thought on this one. Some of where you are, I'm, I'm kind of backing up to before everything Eric just said, is you're in a transition period right now. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed to take some time to transition. It's entirely possible that part of why you're like, I'm not really sure is because you're still kind of settling into this new retirement version of you, which doesn't mean that everything Eric said isn't valuable and important and right on because it totally is. But prior to that, like you don't have to just go, hey, I stopped working. Now I'm going to immediately go into this thing. Right. And you also don't need to feel bad if you take a little bit of time to kind of just be if that makes sense. And like, if it drags on, like if you're like six months, a year later, okay, start doing stuff, right? Like it's, you're done, you transitioned. But just consider that as a piece of this equation. Got it. Kristen? To um, tag on to what Brenda was saying, one of the things I learned about myself is, um, well, about ADHD, as transitions are hard. And Brendan said, you know, if it drags on too long, well, how do we know what too long is? I have learned that I have to have self-awareness around that and plan for it. And so that doesn't mean you have to plan what you're doing in your transition phase, but to have maybe checkpoints and milestones around what am I hoping to achieve during transition? Maybe it's rest. Maybe it's a little bit of exploration of what I want to plan next and have checkpoints where you ask yourself questions. What have I learned the last four weeks? Do I feel ready to transition and start something? Is there some loops I need to close um, first to start the new thing? Not overplaying yourself because I love what Brendan is saying is you just want to be and that's important. However, with our brains, we might just be and five years have gone by and we didn't even realize it. So you've got to plan for the awareness of time, the passage of time around that. Can I add that I am a helper and I sometimes jump into helping situations without even thinking about it. Like I was getting a massage the other day and the woman was talking about how she was legally blind. And I said, oh, I can drive you around. And I'm like, what am I saying? <laughs> um, so I'm worried that I'm going to also just, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with the homeless group for a long time, a homeless assistance group for a long time. And I'm worried that I'm going to get sucked into more roles that I don't want just uh -huh. Yeah, as a fellow helper, like compulsive helper, you're allowed to just not help, right? <laughs> like you retired, you can be like for three months, I'm not helping anybody and find out who you are when you're not helping because much like the cult of productivity, the compulsive nature, nature of being a helper that comes with that, you're like, you're staring at the precipice of I'm not being productive anymore because I retired, which isn't true, but that's what it feels like. Like that's the, that's the cultural message that we're sending. And that means I should overhelp everywhere and overextend myself and like help the random person who I just met, who is giving me a, a massage because they're blind and I have a car. Like that math doesn't make sense. And it's some of that is because you're trying to find your identity and your place because you retired and you're like, now who am I? And a really good way to find out who you are is to just stop and recognize that you're a person of worth, regardless of whether you're productive or helping or not. 
and just have worth and value because you exist for a little while, like three months. I believe too, there's, yeah, I was going to add, I believe too, there's a moderate, you could do a modification piece of this. If we're talking retirement age, a lot of times we know ourselves really well and we know there's that piece of us that, yeah, we're going to help. So what if it was a planned situation? For example, a parallel um, action I take. Everyone that calls and asks me for donations, I already have a place that I dedicate my donation of time or money interest. And I tell them, good luck with your cause. I already have a dedicated spot I give to that. So if you were able to say, I'm going to go help at the shelter for three hours a week, then you can have that feeling of boundaries work anyway, and share with them that you, you know, wish them well with their needs, their cause, their whatever. And I already provide time for that in another arena. And I was going to add, you know, like Brennan said, find out who you are without helping. That would give you some of that. And I would strongly invite you to journal around that. Maybe not even written journaling if that's not your thing, but just contemplation, you know, reflection on what was that experience like telling them no or telling them no and. Mm. I think that's uh, really some really helpful uh, uh, tips. And I love that, Kristen, about saying good luck on what you're doing. I already have a, a, a cause that I'm focusing on. I think that's a really great way to uh, sort of deal with that, that momentarily uncomfortable feeling when someone's asking you for something and you don't want to feel like a jerk by saying no. But like we have to say no to things like that so we could say yes to the things that really, really matter. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we uh, come back, we have uh, we got a bunch more questions, so uh, we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ADHD Rewired's award-winning online coaching and accountability groups. Registration for our winter coaching season is now closed. We filled all five sections and we started this week. So thank you to everyone who registered to join us this season and welcome to the community. Our next season of coaching groups starts at the very end of March. Details to come. Learn more and get invited to our registration for our spring seasons by adding your name to our spring in Trust list at coachingrewired.com. Here at ADHD Rewired, we empower our members by creating a safe and supportive environment that's shame free and judgment free. All we provide tools for learning how to better manage our calendars, build ADHD friendly routines, and create actionable to do lists to achieve our goals. We also believe that ADHD management is about much more than just the tools. It's about being aware of where our time is really going and how our environment affects us. It's about learning how to put ourselves on our calendars, engaging in healthy communication and setting boundaries so we can reduce our feelings of overwhelm and finally make time for the things that matter most to us. And it's about having a supportive community behind us to cheer us on and point out the strengths we have, including the strengths we might forget about when we struggle. If you haven't had much support around your ADHD, then imagine being able to learn and grow in a space where ADHD is understood, where you can encourage others and be encouraged and finally start living the life you truly want to live. What would that be worth to you? If this sounds like the group you've been looking for, go to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our spring season interest list so you can stay up to date for when our spring registration kickoff events will be. That website again is coachingrewired.com to learn more and to get your name added to our spring season interest list. That's coachingrewired.com. ADHD Rewired is not alone. We have more podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network that you can check out and subscribe to, including ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, and ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens. And we're hopefully going to have some new podcasts coming up. Details to be announced. Find ADHD Rewired in all of our shows by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network and subscribe to the show so you can stay up to date with our new episodes that come out every week because next week we're talking to Javier about the impact that asking better questions can have in your life. 
then you can join me and the rest of the ADHD Rewired podcast family and ADHD Rewired coaches every second Tuesday of the month for our monthly live Q&A, which means our next monthly live Q&A is today. That's today at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Go to coachingrewired.com to register and join us on Zoom so you can interact with the panelists and other listeners live and ask your ADHD-related questions. Get more from ADHD Rewired and find this podcast and all of our shows by going to ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. And we're back. All right, we have Emily here, and uh, Emily has a question regarding uh, outcome goals versus process goals. So what, what is the question? Yeah, so I've been working on starting my own business for a little while now, and I have gotten like a couple clients and a little bit of money, you know, like my dad jokes, I framed my first dollar or whatever, but um, I'm basically still stuck, mostly not making money. And so trying to set goals for my business and I'm learning, you know, I'm re- relearning over and over about smart goals and how to like process goals is where a lot of the peer support is telling me are better because you can like control the outcome a little more you Mm -hmm. get to you know it's about what you do but I feel like all the process goals are not really the real goal like I want the outcome of money or the outcome of clients or the outcome of even something like potential clients client leads or something it's just hard for me to let go of working towards outcome and I'm not sure if I have to or should or yeah I would say it doesn't have to be an or I absolutely have have an and. You know, I think that the process goal is the way that we we get to the outcome goal. And I think that both, I think, are actually really, really important. That makes sense. Well, Yeah, I recently was writing about this, and it's really important to also think about process goals as the means of how you get to the outcome. I was recently just seeing so many articles with the new year coming up being like, don't have goals, do this instead. And I'm like, but that's also a goal. It's just a goal by a different name. <laughs> And I think outcome goals are important, but they're also something that you have a lot less control over. Yeah. And so that's what can be the problem with outcome goals is you're like, well, I did everything I was supposed to and I still didn't reach it. Uh, Where with the process goals, you can, I'm doing the things, I'm getting there. And they're kind of more of a short term what you should be doing. Whereas I think the outcome goals are a great way to be like, this is the direction I want to go. It can then inform how I'm setting my process goals and stuff. So I think, yeah, Eric was absolutely right. It's a lot of and, but it, I think it's because culturally we have such a bias towards outcome goals that it can feel a little bit like I have to have them, but really just thinking of more as targets, this is the direction I'm going. And then using the process goals to really inform how you're doing your day to day is going to be a lot more effective than just relying on outcome goals. Thanks. I appreciate that. And I think that goals give us aim. Like goals, when you're setting personal goals, you don't have to hit them like exactly as is, right? Like think about it as you're creating a guide for yourself. You're giving yourself direction because we probably are all really familiar with being just super busy with activity, right? But like, is that the activity that is uh, helping us get closer towards the thing that we're trying to actually do? Or is it just busyness? Right. And so I think if we have the outcome in mind, but focus on the process, like we'll get there. Even if sometimes the you didn't hit it directly on the target, sometimes you don't realize the thing you wanted was sort of next to that target until you're like really close to that target. Like, oh yeah, I wanted to actually do that instead. And that's okay. MJ? I like the idea of outcome goals, but I also don't like them because for me, I get into a little bit of black and white thinking of if I don't reach this outcome goal, I messed up or I failed. So I'm kind of bouncing off of what both you and Will said is having that goal as a target. Even if you hit around the target, you're going in the right direction. But I'm wondering if you have alternatives to those outcome goals. Like if you have a, if there's a backup for a backup plan, if one goal is hit. (laughs) Yeah, like a backup outcome. Like what's, if you have a backup outcome idea or a target, what would be the story that you tell yourself if any of those outcomes that you want don't get met, then what would be next? That's where I get stuck is the black and white thinking. What's the story I tell myself if I don't hit that goal? What's the next thing to go either towards that goal or 
take a different goal? Yeah, I think for me, it's like, it's also the the binary thinking of it's either this outcome or that outcome, even if it is a backup. Like there's actually like tons of choices, like sometimes. So yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it comes down to that story of what we do tell ourselves. It's like, are we looking for a feeling when we say if we do hit that outcome goal? And what what if we do hit that outcome goal that we want, but the feeling doesn't come? Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate all this. Uh, lots of good food for thought. Thanks, I think you're Emily. on the right track. Absolutely. You're you're kicking ass, Emily. Thank you. All right. Let's go to our next question. All right. We got Kimberly. Kimberly, what's your question? So Hi. I've been trying to get into live streaming a couple times a week in the morning. And I've been trying to make it as executive dysfunction friendly as possible. But it still feels like something is missing, but I'm not sure what that thing is. And then things I currently do is I have a checklist and then I have a file that helps me all of the URLs and software I need. And if I remember, I try to set up my equipment the night before. Okay. So first of all, you're doing some amazing stuff with your systems. So I just want you to know that. Second thing. When you say executive dysfunction friendly, does it just feel like it's uncomfortable getting started? Oh, like I definitely wear out faster when I'm streaming versus when I'm doing the same thing. Like let's say it's an art stream, so I'm drawing and normally I could do this all day, but once you add live streaming into it, suddenly I'm tired after a few hours. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's so interestingly that so what are we on? Episode four hundred and 60 something like that. And I still to this day when I'm like starting an interview, I still feel like I like I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I have, you know, pretty fine tuned uh, processes. So I think it's just important to to recognize is there is it a process issue or is it just kind of like a a getting on to the starting piece issue? But it sounds like you are you got a lot of really good processes. What's your why for live streaming? Uh, it's kind of a tangent from working on a project I'm super passionate about, partially because I get to talk about things that are super exciting in the project. And like, well, I mean, I'm already drawing this for hours and hours. I might as well make some hashtag content out of it by live streaming. What's the part that's exhausting to you? Sometimes it's managing chat when someone does come in and or being slightly demotivated when nobody says anything. <laughs> Like no one actually comes. And I, I'm sure part of it is a product of me choosing to live stream in the morning when everyone's got work in school. And it's the most convenient time for me. Have you joined any like online groups for live streamers? I'm in a few groups. And have you asked them how they kind of manage their sort of their energy while they're doing I it? I think I talked about it at one point briefly because there was one time where I was super tired and I mentioned it and they're like, yeah, you know, if you're tired, just stop. Yeah. MJ? Well, first of all, transitions are hard, Mm -hmm. but it sounds like you have a lot of physical prep done to transition into the live streaming. So my -hmm. question then would be, what are you doing to mentally and emotionally prepare beforehand for live streaming? And what are you doing afterwards to decompress from streaming? Because I know for me, I have to take some time to mentally and emotionally prep for being here. And I know Mm -hmm. that after this, I probably need to lie on the floor for about half an hour just because there's something about being live that is executive function draining. So taking those two things into account, the emotional and mental prep before and after, do you have any routines in place for that? It's kind of squeezed between what I normally do in the morning, which is like breakfast, short exercise and whatnot. And then it's squeezed between that and then when I have to get ready for a job, which I happened to get a part time job right as I was starting streaming, which I know also hasn't helped get used to streaming because I, oh, now it's like, oh, I have to stop after a couple hours. So I can actually go to work at the day job I now have. Do you ever find the streaming sort of energy adding? Like, does it energize you in any any part of it energize you? Or is it regularly just training? Like, the thing that seems to help me is also frustrating, uh, is that I put on the right music, but the problem is uh, music I like is copyrighted. And so Twitch has issues with that being audible. Can you put, so, like, an earbud in, like, one of your ears? It's just you listening to it? I can probably it? do that. Because that's, I, that music is, like, music is kind of like medicine. Like, the right music can totally alter your mood. Kristen, mm-hmm. you got something? Really quickly, because of what you just said, Eric, planning those transitional bookends. Also, 
if music is something that obviously speaks to you, find music pieces for your transition in and transition out to help recharge. If that, if it's not music, maybe there's something else that's a sensory thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's cool. And it really does sound like you are definitely understanding the system stuff and getting all that flow set up. So uh, it gets easier the more you do it. But, um, you know, I would just encourage you to make sure you're enjoying it. And maybe doing video that's not live stream, maybe you might be more of your cup of tea or even communicating something how you're not going to be interacting in the chat while you're doing your art um, and that you'll respond to questions at the end of what you're what you're making. So I think there's a lot of different options to really look at what's kind of what's your why and then what's the thing that's draining you and what are you finding to be sort of most uh, uh, fulfilling uh, for you. So I hope that's helpful, Kimberly. Thank you. You bet. All right, let's go to another one. Well, we've got a question that was upvoted by Sheena. Do you have any advice for when we find ourselves frozen in total overwhelm? I tend to have this happen between periods of go, 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 driven by the urgent deadlines of the teaching semester for university. After those intense periods, I tend to crash and freeze due to the overwhelm of realizing that everything else exists all at once. I'd like to figure out how to be more intentional year round. I struggle because it's hyper focus or nothing, and I rarely feel in control of the switch. This is a great question. I think part of this comes down to tracking. Because I think one of the things that sounds like might be happening is you are waiting until you're exhausted, until you slow down. And, you know, if you're, if you're kind of in go, go, go mode and like you're not registering that, oh, I'm kind of getting tired here. Oh, I should maybe start thinking I'm taking a break until it's like, oh my gosh, I hit a wall and now my brain feels like mush and I can't think and I don't want to be around anybody. And, you know, so it's like hitting that, hitting that wall. So trying to track how, how, when does that happen? And are you able to, in some kind of way, sort of backtrack and then create a cue that's external so you're not counting on that internal cue to being tired? Like, you know, for me, like I learned when I do long, long meetings, I get to this point and Kat, Kat's always the, probably the first one that can see like, like oh, Eric's checking out because I just kind of get this look on my face. Um, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so I know for me, like really like two to three hours is really when I need to take a, a break on a given day. But if I also am not giving myself enough fun time and I'm working, 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 all of a sudden the things that I actually enjoy doing, I can't activate to do. And so when I'm starting to find that, why can't I activate on these things? And I reflect and I kind of pull back. I'm like, oh, it's because I've been going so hard for so long. And so it's kind of finding how do we take those breaks before we feel like we need them. But taking them based on our track record of when do we tend to burn out? Like how much time can we be working hard before we actually need a break? Before we feel like we're going to break? Any other thoughts on this? MJ? MJ, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, I've done this before. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess a couple of questions that I would consider thinking about looking at this, because it sounds like me, when we find ourselves in overwhelm or on the way to burnout, what is our self-care looking like? And if anybody here is sort of in that burnout phase or like feeling like you're on the way to burnout, like what are you doing that recharges you versus doing things for others? I used to think that constantly being busy was just a way of life. And anytime anybody else had anything that was going on, I had to be there or I had to, we were talking earlier, like a compulsive fixer, helper kind of person. And then I realized, and this is just for me, I don't know if anybody else can relate, but being in a constant state of overwhelm was a way for me to avoid my own self-care and my own meaning-making which in itself made, made it feel, made my life feel overwhelming because I was forgetting about me. And what it sounds like here is where can you stick you in that equation so that you can have time for you? Well, one thing I find really helpful for overwhelm is just writing down why I feel like I'm overwhelmed because often it's just this cerebral, like uh, I'm stuck. And then if I like, write Like I feel overwhelmed because I can't do this. And I'm like, oh, well, I can't do that. Like, I don't need to feel overwhelmed by it. I just can't. I need to find a different solution. And it's often, what my issue often is, is my thought brain is going too fast to settle down on thinking about solutions. And I'm just focused on the problem. And uh, having the problem written down, I'm like, well, I know what it is there. Now I can look at that. I think that's great. And along with that, you can also just talk to a friend. That's an alternate solution to there. 
I personally like writing things down because I tend to be a very private person, but talking to, with, through to other people, they're like, oh, so you're doing this. And they're like, could you do this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, it's, it seems reasonable. Thanks, Will. All right. Um, well, let's, actually, let's jump in with a, one more quick break, and then we will uh, we'll be right back to uh, try to answer some more of your questions. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from Adult Study Hall at adultstudyhall.com. And support for tackling your big projects and to-do lists can start with us. What's on your project list that you'd love to finally take action on, but need some body doubling and real-time accountability to get started? If you're ready to get the ball rolling on your big goals and projects, then join me and hundreds of other adults with ADHD at adultstudyhall.com. It's free for the first week to try and only $19.99 a month after that. Do real-time verbal check-ins to help to keep you on task and join our Adult Study Hall Plus sessions or ASH Plus, which are themed and guided sessions that happen every week. We have themed sessions like writing and creative work and tackling dreaded tasks and cleaning and decluttering. We have career-focused sessions and even a monthly Pomodoro dance party. If you prefer to work at your own pace but don't want to work alone, then jump into our 24-7 drop-in room for body doubling at any time of day or night that works for you, no matter your location or time zone. Learn more about our Ash Plus sessions, our 24-7 drop-in room, and to stay up to date about any new upcoming sessions. Again, it's free for the first week and only $19.99 a month after that. Get started on your New Year's goals and projects at adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. We'll see you there. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. I want to thank Mark W., our newest patron, who joined us over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. You got ad-free episodes coming your way. If you love the show and want to support the work that we are doing, consider becoming a patron. At $5 a month or more, you can get ad-free episodes of the show. Then at $25 a month or more, you can get ad-free episodes and join me for our patron-only monthly coaching calls that we do every fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you would like to hear those coaching calls, then you can get the audio recordings of our monthly calls and our ad-free episodes when you become a patron at a $10 a month level. Whether it's for the ad-free episodes, our monthly coaching calls, or you simply just want to support our podcast because you believe in the work that we are doing, your support is very much appreciated. Remember, podcasts are free to you, the listener, but they are not free to produce. So your support does help us do the things that we do to help you. Thanks to all of our patrons, old and new, for your support. Consider becoming a patron over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And if you sign up for the yearly plan, each yearly plan makes it out to be about one month free. So if you do the $25 a month, but you do it for the yearly plan, it's like getting a month free. Come join us and become a patron. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. And we are back. All right, uh, let's uh, let's take another question. Who wants to uh, who wants to read one of those questions? Eric, I heard you and a podcast guest lament the challenges you both have in grocery stores. Could you explain on why this is such a thing for those with ADHD? I shop the same familiar stores and mostly buy the same things. So it's curious how I wander around back and forth for an hour when I'm only one bu buying one bag of stuff. Ugh. My therapist hasn't yet taken up my offer to join me there to see the madness I go through in a store. <laughs> ha. Yes. Okay. So... Part of the, the neural networks of attention, it's not just about what we are focusing on. It's also about what we are not focusing on or inhibition. Our brain does not do that. Not well anyways. So everything that's not the thing you went to the store for that becomes in your, your sort of visual proximity becomes something that's entering your attention space, right? And so it is like usually, well, not always, but like when I go to the store, sometimes I will try to... I'll, I'll go in with like a hoodie on and um, really just try to like go really, really fast and focused. But I also fall into that as well, where I'm like looking at all this other stuff. And, it, and it's funny because like there's a short window where I kind of enjoy doing that, 
And then I crashed through that window and I kind of hate everything and everybody and I want to just get out of the store, right? Like, because I get overwhelmed by all the sensory input. Uh, my partner and I, we were uh, uh, doing some holiday shopping last week at uh, Home Goods, which is a, such a fun store until it becomes like just overstimulating. And I hit that point at about 40 minutes in. Um, it's because our brain's not filtering, right? And so if our brain is not naturally filtering, it makes sense why we get overwhelmed and overloaded with, st with sensory stimuli, which is why, like, thank goodness for all these services like Instacart and, and things like that. Like, it is, oh my gosh, I just, I love it. I love that. But that's, that is kind of why. It's just that, that ability to kind of turn down how your brain is processing external stimuli. Kristen? So I think based on what you said, because I just want to just uh, notice the the fact that not everyone can utilize the services of Instacart, maybe by where they live or it's an economical thing, something like that, that based on what Eric just shared with us all, maybe going in there with a timer for ourselves and with something written in front of us or a audio that we listen to of what we're getting, whatever helps you with your learning process of what am I doing? What am I here for? And if you do want to browse for something, maybe sticking it to one category, just limiting those, those choices might be helpful. Okay. So when you were saying that, Christian, I guess you just came up with an idea. So I, I actually have used this to get myself out of the office is I will like order Chipotle for pickup and I'll do it. And this is Chipotle on like five minutes from here. So I'll select the have it ready as soon as possible. So I don't want to eat a cold burrito bowl. Like I want my stuff piping hot, right? So like maybe going to the grocery store and then like scheduling, a, whether it's picking up some food or even like a, a coffee or, you know, something where you actually have some external accountability now to go be at a place because you just put a couple bucks down to get yourself some food or a drink or something like that. So that can actually help engineer that urgency. Um, then I would just encourage you to have some maybe a reminder alarms so you don't forget that you did that. MJ? I'm actually going to tag off of something that Kristen said with the timer. So with the timer, right? But if you're playing a game that, yet, right, you're going to beat the timer, getting out of the grocery store, making it fun, having a list and seeing how fast you can get the things on your list. I mean, going to the grocery store with a specific list is one thing, but in terms of the overwhelm, right, if you give yourself something else to focus on, Maybe depending on the person, it might sort of drown out the other stuff because you're so focused on either beating the timer or maybe you have the timer, but you've also let somebody know, hey, I'm going to send you a picture of me in my car after I've left or have gotten out of the grocery store with a timer and make a game out of it either with yourself or with somebody else. That's all I got. I also actually find it helpful to put on like headphones and music when I go into a, to a store. And it does sort of serve to take some of the sensory processing away from all the external stuff and you're sort of channeling some of that, that sensory information. Will? Yeah, I was just going to mention uh, noise canceling headphones are, were a game changer for me going shopping. And when you're wearing headphones, people don't bug you at the store because they're like, oh, you're, they're not going to listen to me. So it's kind of like a good signaling device, like, hey, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to respond. Um, and then along with that, just not going to stores during their primary grocery hours, like right after school gets out or going to the store early in the morning is usually it's fairly empty. It's a nice experience. You're like, oh, there's like four other people in here with me. And they just fully stock the store. So it's actually, you can actually get the things you want. Yeah. So uh, when you go to the store, it makes a big difference. And some stores also have like sensory friendly hours now, at least in my area, I've seen like they have early hours where it's like, oh yeah, we're going to have the lights dimmed a little bit. So they're not like the really blaring and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to have the music that nobody likes playing and <laughs> all that. Awesome. All right, um, let's go to the next question. This question is from Jeff. You mentioned dealing with emotional dysregulation before doing the intensive, I'm assuming for the coaching groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so dealing with emotional dysregulation. I've only recently started coming to grips with this. Can you say something about this and maybe offer some suggestions, you know, managing emotional dysregulation? Yeah, so, um, so I think the question is asking about could we do in the sort of the pre-registration process for our coaching groups, uh, one of the things we tell people that if emotional dysregulation is one of your primary challenges and it's interfering on a regular basis with you doing the things you want them to do, um, that 
we kind of recommend that you work with a therapist first uh, before signing up for our groups because it's it's hard and it's going to push you out of your comfort zone. Um, and we want people to to have you know for learning to be accessible and for them to be able to lean in even when it's uncomfortable. So what we what we've seen it when people have a hard time uh, sort of doing that. Those are the people who I, I've seen have not gotten as much as we would like to see from the group. But as far as like some of the actual like sort of separating that from the groups, but like how do we manage emotional dysregulation? So you know, exercise is a big one on that. Um, we know that getting enough sleep is a big one. Um, make sure you're eating. You probably have all heard of the, that HALT acronym, right? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, right? Like don't do things, you know, if you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I know if I get, if I haven't eaten in a while and my mind is starting to wear off, like I get irritable. So it's like knowing what, what are those things that sort of drive the, the irritability. Um, I know if I haven't slept well, sort of same thing. So it's really looking at what are those things that are going to really support us in more emotional uh, regulation. But I also think that there is a piece of, you know, the sort of like the, the bottom up emotional dysregulation and it's the top down emotional dysregulation. Um, and I think that when we when we look at how our environment is affecting us versus how is like we just learned that we have ADHD and like I'm trying to make sense of all of this. And that can be very uh, emotional. And I think that in that realm, I would say something like being part of our coaching community and, and sort of doing this stuff with other people who you will almost immediately relate to in a way that for a lot of people, they describe as kind of mind blowing, like how, how much they relate and how helpful that actually is on um, helping them sort of see themselves in a, a better light. Because, you know, we, we are often the harshest critic to ourselves, right? And yet we tend to see all the good things other people are doing. And when we're in a space where like everyone kind of seems to do that, we start to realize, oh, we're actually being kind of harsh on ourselves. And we can kind of see that in a more self-compassionate kind of way. One of the things we like to say about our coaching groups, because it is coaching, it's not therapy, but it's really therapeutic. I think doing the stuff with other people with ADHD, I just think it's, it is so profoundly helpful. Anything else anyone wants to add to that one? MJ. I'm going to jump off of what Will said earlier too about journaling. If this is something that is new and you're exploring sort of what emotional dysregulation is for you with your unique ADHD, journaling. For me, I didn't even know what emotions I was experiencing going through emotional dysregulation. Like, am I angry? Am I upset? Am I tired? Am I... I, I couldn't pinpoint it. So it was through a lot of that journaling that I was like, oh, I'm, or even just, just feelings. I'm feeling exhausted, which is making me feel not worthy of doing the next thing. I'm feeling angry because I didn't do this thing, or maybe somebody said the, a wrong thing that sort of set me off. So journaling about the potential emotions you might be feeling and what in your environment is making those emotions come up because for me like I said I didn't know <laughs> I thought I was just a hothead most of the time <laughs> but yeah be, having that awareness really helps to say okay this is what I might expect for myself and then the power of the pause mm -hmm. you know and I think another thing to also explore is is the emotional dysregulation piece is this more of a function of uh the ADHD or is this something that gets triggered that is something that's rooted in trauma? Um, and I think that that is also a really, really important and nuanced thing to explore. And that, that is a, something you can work with a therapist. And I think it's important to work with trauma-informed therapists uh, who also do have an understanding of ADHD. Um, I know that sometimes those can be hard to find, but it is, it is worthwhile to see if you can seek therapists that have that knowledge and uh, experience. All right. Well, I think we are coming here to the end. I want to thank everyone, uh, our, our panelists, coaches, podcasters, and you, the listener, and the people who are coming here asking questions uh, each and every month. Uh, it is, uh, you know, wrapping out this 2022. I feel like this, uh, like 2020, 2021 and this year has kind of just been this, this uh, long extended, weird, I don't even know what to call it. 
Um, Kristen, I didn't, I didn't read the lips. Transition, because I am a skipped record right now on that. <laughs> it is. It feel, it's felt like a big transition from a pandemic and a lockdown and coming back into yeah. society and how we have to live um, for safety. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it does, it feels like we're going in this, this like, are we out of the pandemic? It feels like sort of yes, but not completely. Um, so I just wish that everyone is uh, safe and healthy, um, you know, 2023. And, uh, and we have a little bit less dumpster fire uh, across the world um, in, in 2023. So um, we got to leave though with a moment of that. Will? So I was bringing my home, tree home the other day and my neighbor saw me getting it down and asked me, oh, are you going to put that up yourself? I just looked at him and I was like, no, I'm going to put it up in my living room. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's a dirty dad joke. <laughs> yeah, so that one went more, more uncle joke. <laughs> <laughs> Approved. <laughs> Man, that oh, that that is that's awesome. a drunkle joke right there. A drunkle, a dr drunk uncle. Oh my gosh, that yeah, drunkle. You know though why I really like telling uh, uh, dad jokes because mm. he laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> All right, everyone, we do this the same uh, time every month, so we will hopefully see you back here next month. Thanks, everybody. Have a great new year. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. 
Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni, Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson, The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown, The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.